we ready? Yep. So um, uh, a year ago, we talked about 5G. That was a major, a major uh, component of the discussion, and we had several pages that were, we have published actually. Uh, as a result of the discussion last year, we published an editorial note. Um, and uh, this year, in between then and, and now, I went to a, a presentation by Roberto Padovani, who is one of the founders of Qualcomm, as you probably know. And he, his, the topic of his presentation was um, what the 5G chip is going to be. And the first disclaimer that he made is, you know, the, the good news is, I mean, the bad news is that there isn't going to be a major improvement in the throughput, that we can just not extract that, much, that many more bits out of the frequency that we have. So the route that they have gone now, it seems, from the presentation, is that they have um, standardized most of the interfaces in use today, uh, adding some new ones like IoT and machine to machine, and other future ones that are in the process of being standardized, and they have decided to put them all in a single chip that is a tiny little thing that is about the quarter of the size of a quarter coin. So uh, the point that now, to make a long story short, what I'm trying to address with this panel is he said, uh, so having said that, he said most of the advances are not going to come from the physical layer, at least for this generation. Uh, the advances in 5G are going to come from the networking capabilities that are going to manage these interfaces. And before you start, I want to make a corollary to that. And of course, with that, those many interfaces available now, we have that many more security problems arising from the larger surface space. So if you can address those two questions, it would be wonderful. You want to? Go ahead. You did, you want to go ahead? Yeah, closest to you. So the first question was on whether the gains that we're going to see in 5G have plateaued at the access level. And the second question was security related. Right. So I'm not an access guy. I have tremendous respect for people who understand bits, hertz, kilohertz, and so forth, but they're beyond my intellectual capacity. Um, I know that in our labs, we can push almost two gigabits per second, um, you know, to mobile endpoints. So I know that um, the access um, is going to plateau at some point. I do not know whether it's going to be two gigabits, it's going to be 10 gigabits. But clearly, the more bits that we push through will have um, some impact on the protocols that use these. Um, we are already seeing the fact that there is all these ultra high definition 4K, 8K, all these media formats coming to take the bandwidth that is being created. What impact would that have on protocols, on congestion, when you're looking at 2 gigabits per second, 3 gigabits per second? You know, what impact does millisecond type latency have on tactile type of applications? I think there is some work going on in various places, academic as well as industrial. Um, you know, there's buzzwords like network slicing, which essentially tries to allocate the networks, you know, a chunk of a network to applications that have a certain profile of expectations from the network. Um, you can grow and shrink this depending on if you have excess capacity with small cells owned by an operator, or you can um, you know, get roaming capacity of a competitor network or cable or what have you. So to me, the interesting things are more on what's going to be happening at the, you know, at the application layer um, um, and stuff. So that, that's the first, you know, sort of stream of consciousness for, for your first answer. Okay, great. Thank you. And, and uh, the obvious is heading now to follow because one of the things that we discussed with Palavani after the presentation was among the management tools that you're going to need to do to manage these interfaces, of course, you better be working at the networking layer, which is a project right here to you. I, I yeah. So let me just follow up a little bit on that. Namely, as we all know, everybody who uses 5G uh, uses it somewhat differently. Uh, and that much hasn't changed. That much hasn't changed. And so one of I think the fundamental issues, and that goes to your question, at least indirectly, is how much 5G is essentially going to be a break with tradition or just a layered on uh, type of network. In a sense, what we've seen so far, at least, that every G, except maybe from 1G to 2G, which 
analog to digital was a pretty clean break, uh, has really been you take all the old stuff and you add the new stuff on top of that. Uh, and that, to some extent, has led to a management complexity that is becoming increasingly difficult to, uh, to handle, uh, where many networks essentially, particularly in uh, less developed countries, are getting out of the network management business and leave it to, say, Ericsson or somebody else to do, simply because that's no longer viable to even, so say, fly their network uh, in that for cybersecurity reasons, but also, I think, for just managing all these layers or boxes and so on. And one of the issues that I just don't understand well enough is, is there, I recognize that there's this difficulty, you have to support legacy devices, you have to support legacy applications, as to what is the incentive to move beyond, like essentially what is still a voice centric, architecturally voice centric network of gateways and where internet access was really just an add-on service where you had these GGSN type of models, all of these boxes in the middle, which don't really, for most services don't seem to do a whole lot. In a sense, they don't actually offer a whole lot of value uh, to that, but do offer um, another box that can fail. Uh, and so my one of, to me, the interesting question is, as part of 5G, are carriers willing to get to a lower complexity model that is much closer to kind of a Wi-Fi model as opposed to a uh, classical cellular model? The reason I think this ties directly to what Vijay was saying is we can all talk about high bandwidth, but unless people are willing to pay for it, it's a lab prototype. And my general sense is that in most countries, we've reached the point where people aren't willing to pay substantially more people, I mean, consumers, which are the vast majority of network users, aren't willing to pay substantially more for their broadband, uh, for their mobile broadband experience. And it isn't just a whole lot of untapped potential there, for, well, just because you've now reached a point, a price point, where uh, it's already crowding out uh, home networks at the lower income levels, at least in the U.S. Uh, the uh, broadband penetration for residential broadband is actually going down. Not much, but it is going down, not up. Uh, and anecdotally, it is largely because people don't want to pay uh, a rather substantial cost of residential broadband in the U.S., where you're talking $50 and up is kind of a minimum useful uh, price point, and uh, in addition, pay $50 a person for um, your, your smartphone connectivity. Right. So that is, I think, unless you saw that all this 4K and 8K just isn't going to happen because people aren't willing to buy these $150 plans that have, quote, unlimited uh, Price plans, because otherwise your your two gig, and we talked about that, your two gig uh, gigabit per second connectivity wipes out your two gigabyte balance in just about eight seconds. Uh, so that isn't going to be terribly useful uh, for most of the type of things that and, we do. And it's kind of a mirror of what, what happened with Verizon and Fios, right? I mean, uh, Fios was a, a huge white elephant that cost sixty billion dollars to deploy. I'm not sure again, it's probably similar. And people just weren't willing to pay even hundred dollars for hundred and fifty megabits per second. But they wanted was mobility, but not not uh, not hundred and fifty megabits per second to the to the desktop. Maybe some of us did, but not in the general public as you say. So uh so would you like to add some, some Yeah. Questions? Let's say that my personal let's say contribution to the discussion related to 5G might be from the architectural perspective. Uh, personally, I do believe that the 5G initiative can be seen on one side as an unprecedented opportunity to put together a number of heterogeneous research fields. On the other side, it might become a, a, just a brand new way of spreading buzzwords, which is a, a risk. But personally, I'm really happy uh, of being capable of doing research in fields like how to properly manage a federated domain 
where you have to put together computation resources, communication resources, SDN controllers, and let everything work by offering a northbound interface to applications. Mm -hmm. At least in Europe, we're working hard on this, and we're working, all universities and small and medium enterprises are working on this also because there's some bias from the European community. Uh, we have a call that tends up in November, and I'm writing one of these proposals together with partners from all over Europe. And actually what Vijay was mentioning is the, the slicing buzzword, you know, is one of the uh, terms that you are using there. You have standardization bodies that are involved from ETSI to ITU to ITF. You have the same terms that are used in different, with different meanings inside different communities. So for example, before writing our proposal, we're debating on the meaning of concepts like what is a slate, what is a slice, a slate is at the domain level, a slice is at the federated level. How are we going to manage all this stuff? And we were discussing orchestration versus choreography, for example. And now we are converging. I think this is an important work that we're doing on at least the meaning of these things by designing a, a, an overall federated architecture whereby you know that you cannot, for example, impose a centralized control on a, a federation of different domains. And so there you have to go for distribution. We are going to define some intent-based paradigms to the configuration of the network. And I think that all this is really interesting. The important thing is that you never lose contact with reality, which means that you have to work on what they call the verticals, so use cases, applications. And the applications I'm listening, uh, I'm hearing about are uh, related to, okay, the usual streaming, scalable streaming, which by the way is one of the applications we're working on, but also domotics, Internet of Things, and, and the like. So everything can be mixed together, and if you arrive at a clear definition of the different planes, I think that there is space for uh, very, very important contributions in, in this field. Can you be more specific, all three of you, about what we, can you be more specific, uh, all three of you, about what, what uh, research projects in particular would be useful to pursue in these areas that you have described kind of in a more general way now? Because I think in the audience and in the possible paper we'll publish, we'd like to have some ideas for work that can be generated in the next year, and uh, hopefully we'll have more uh, paper submissions to IPTCOM next, <laughs> next year. I don't know. I'll... And one of the difficulties, and we talked about this, I believe, in, in previous panels, is research really has become two very different, uh, taking the two very different paths. I mean, one is very much you're doing something within an existing constraint, constraint system. Uh, but it doesn't mean it is shorter term. It is just you take a uh, whatever a cellular system as largely given and you're trying to add things onto the existing system. Uh, and you might make it more functional, add, but you're not questioning at all the basic 4G model, you're not questioning kind of the way that cell companies are operating today in most countries. Uh, all of these things are essentially part of your engineering constraints. And there's a set of interesting engineering as well as analytical and other challenges that you can address and need to be addressed uh, in, in those. Uh, and then the other one, which I would say is more of a kind of school reality type of model of research, uh, is the, you don't care what's out there, and you're just, you're exploring more alternative realities, if you say that. And, and, and initially, and I think this is changing a lot of it, some of the name data networking and content-oriented networking fell a little bit into that scenario. I don't know if that's still as true. I, maybe some of the more architectural things that I've been alluding to, namely where you basically say, hey, well, we design a multi-network multi-access, uh, web and use, man, with clearly defined interfaces, but not worrying about backward compatibility as much, is a somewhat different approach. And I, and I suspect there's room and value for both. It's really hard to get funding for the latter, but I, 
particularly, I think, at the European level, uh, but and to some extent the NSF level as well, and certainly not corporate funding. Uh, but it is, or well, if you're within the constraints of Bell Labs, it's probably impossible to do that these days. Uh, but it is one where we should think about our, what are our constraints that our research operates under. Right? And this is not just for physical constraints, as in, in Shannon limits, but really of what is what do we assume as given? Do we assume TCP/IP as given? Do we assume uh, the basic uh, model of a centrally managed single owner system? What you might describe the cell phone system to be at a at the first level of abstraction is nobody is, in many places is questioning the model that you have a cell company that at least rents towers, owns spectrum, owns antennas and radio network, runs the diameter server, and has a also operates a number of special applications such as multimedia, say, I mean, Volte or RCS or whatever it happens to be, I, and we should just be clear on which branch, should I say, roughly speaking, of networking research we are talking about. So I think with that taxonomy of, of, of research, you know, laid out very nicely by Henning, uh, you know, let me focus on, on a specific um, example of, of some of the research issues that certainly I am dealing with. You know, one of the things that I've been dealing with is large-scale analytic platforms, especially in the, in the um, context of 5G. Now, if you take a look at the data that is generated today in enterprise networks, even networks like uh, Twitter, and you take a look at the data that's generated today um, in extreme networks like high-energy physics, the data that gets generated at CERN is to the order of petabytes a second. Right? The data that gets generated in enterprise uh, global networks is much less, right? So let me give you an example. Of all the people sitting here, how many of you know what is the record in tweets per second seen on the Twitter network? Very recent, right? Because uh, when Trump is active, when active. <laughs> 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 I think you are right, Henry. Uh, both Twitter and Facebook have, have been maxed out by Trump. <laughs> so uh, let, let, me, let me differentiate. I'm not talking about tweets going out. S Trump sends to his 25 well, million no, followers. The ones that he what I'm talking about is tweets coming into the, the Twitter network, which are more stochastic, which Twitter cannot control. Well. Tweets going out from Trump to 25 million people, Twitter network can control how to send them. No, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in the tweets coming in. About them. Yeah. Yeah. So... It, Give me, a, give me a number. D don't Google it. Just give me a number. <laughs> it's 143,199 tweets per second. It was a show in Japan that generated that many tweets into the Twitter network. Now, before I started, stochastic requests coming into the Twitter network, not going out of the Twitter network. There's enough people in Japan that I could, you know. But to me, the bigger, the bigger point is I would have thought that it would be something to the order of millions or maybe a billion per second, tweets per second. But it's much less. So I see telecom as somewhere between even these global enterprise type of networks. I don't know what else to call Twitter and Facebook except global enterprise networks. And high energy physics community. I believe telecom data is somewhere in the middle. We are talking about gigabytes, and another example is if you take a look at Twitter and Facebook, most of their protocols are based on HTTP. Yeah. So the analysis that is being done is usually done at an HTTP farm where you already have the HTTP requests. Whereas in telecom, I'm going to put high energy physical site because that's an extreme case. In telecom, you need to move large data sets from the source to the data center where you're going to do analytics. And when those data sources weigh to the order of gigabits or gigabytes, then all these uh, tools that we have today in the form of Spark Streaming, in the form of you know, publish subscribe brokers, don't quite scale to that level because they, their workloads are much smaller. 
They may handle high frequency of incoming, but they don't necessarily handle large data sets. So I think that is going to be at least, you know, definitely I'm looking at that particular so area. So what's the specific research, research issue you're addressing there? So the specific research issue is how to build a scalable 5G data analytic and prediction platform. We're that is and, 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 uh, everything from getting the data, from cleaning it up, from transforming it, from storing it, from accessing it, from putting it to a model, from generating the result from a model, from distributing that result to various, um, you know, subscribers of the model. No, I mean, we can't architecture it here. It's not necessarily a backbone issue. Okay. It's more about how the protocols are going to behave. If you take a look at some of these machine learning protocols, why do we do cross-fold validation? Right? We used to do cross-fold validation because data was not available in mass quantities. Right. So we wouldn't want to do cross-fold validation of data we have. Today, with data being so voluminous, we don't need cross-fold validation. We can validate our models on data that constantly arrives. Mm. Now, when data constantly arrives, you have the concept of something called concept drift, where you have a machine learning model, and you're sending it data, and you're causing it to recognize bad data as good data, and over time, it recognizes, you know, you've changed the behavior of that model. Now, under certain circumstances, that's a good thing. Because if you want to model the stock market, the stock market has stocks that are going to go up or down. So you want concept drift. But I would, I would say that in telecommunication protocols, I don't want my SIP machine learning model to suddenly take in data coming in from, it, from the outside and start recognizing bad messages as being good. Right? So you cannot have concept drift in communication protocols, or you have to reduce concept drift in communication protocols. Another example, virtual machines. They are used all over the place today. I have a lot of traffic. I spawn up a SIP virtual machine. Somebody attacks it. The machine generates lots of messages. The traffic dies down, and the machine is decommissioned. What do I do with those orphan events? They are still there, right? I have to somehow make use of them because clearly I was under attack. I cannot throw them away. So there's lots of these issues that I think will lead to, or certainly, you know, would attract researchers like, you know, Simon and Henning students and some of the folks in industrial research labs to, to, to look at these issues more concretely. Wonderful. Would you like to address some? Yeah, personally, obviously, the example that I can bring to the panel is related to the real-time services. So real-time communication, uh, also here, dynamic deployment of RTC architectures in a scalable way by leveraging concepts like the microservices architectures, like uh, SDN controllers, uh, in a proper way, I would say. And when I'm thinking of these kind of services, um, I'm thinking of uh, deployments that have to stick to the real-time requirement, which means, for example, that you cannot uh, allow for more than uh, 200 or 300 milliseconds if you want to have a, a reliable streaming uh, experience. And in that case, you need to look after a number of different issues that can come out which uh, belong to the various trunks of the entire communication path. So from the access network to the distribution, um, the distribution either tree or mesh, depending on what you have to do. Because if you are doing a, a simple streaming, you can rely on a tree. If you are going to do a bidirectional communication, you, you have to go for different topologies. And all these calls for a, um, an integrated management of all of the different components that come into play. And for this, I think that we have now some nice tools that are isolated, that need to be properly integrated um, in order to become effective on the wide scale. Uh, this is something that many of us are working upon, and this entails research on the protocols, 
research on the computation part and research on the control of the devices. Uh, there are also other aspects that might come into play for reliability. So, for example, if you want to look also after migration of live sessions, this is something that is nowadays feasible. It's quite complicated, but it's something really useful in some interesting scenarios. And, for example, we're looking also after this. Uh, an example might be the live migration of not virtual machine, but rather container-based components, which is much more difficult when compared to a situation where you have the hypervisor, you might have some iSCSI uh, facility to, to rely upon. And in, in the container-based scenario, this becomes much, much more difficult. But if you arrive at uh, this kind of uh, target, you, you're done with the number of issues that are very, very challenging nowadays. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Henning, I have a question for you, which was generated by your presentation and your mention of the unmentionable. Um, it, it, we came to the conclusion from your presentation that security is going in the wrong direction. Uh, in the old days, we had, uh, in particular in, in the context of IoT, but I think it's true everywhere, in the old days, you had application-specific uh, devices that at least they had, you know, a limited number of, of functions that you would do. And now you have a, you have a Linux-based system that has that's basically wide open, and the direction is the opposite. So that leads to the big question, the big word, cybersecurity. We know that it's a big thing because so we've been told by uh, by one of the candidates to the president of the United States, but he doesn't seem to know what cybersecurity is, at least from three uh, uh, public events where he was challenged to explain what that is. So uh, my question is to you, the three of you, what is the role of scientists to uh, indoctrinate uh, the world about what those problems are and what can we do by way of collaborations with law schools, with business schools, with uh, social science departments to perhaps try to change the paradigm that seems to be woefully in the wrong direction? So, uh, interesting. obviously, a more than just a research question, but um, there are two. Because it involves, you know. But I mean, there is a, a role for research there, which I'll get to in a second. But the, uh, uh, the first one is I think this is one of those areas where the rest of the world, to some extent, believes that engineers, scientists, whatever, will solve that problem sooner or later, and we just have to kind of survive until that happens. Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily the, the correct answer. And we have to, as on the engineering side, push back and say that this is to some large extent about incentives and implementation and not magic science like provably correct operating right. systems or whatever uh, in that. And so this is where the business school aspect comes in is the, uh, the notion that you have a, um, how do you provide the right economic incentives for people to do what people know how to do? And they just, they just don't do it uh, in that. So this is a much more of a, if you want to, use a very rough analogy, you think of medicine, we tend to think of what I think of as really kind of three aspects, the personal, namely what you do, how often you go to the gym or whatever you do, what, how healthy you eat, uh, there is the true classical medical, namely how do you study diseases, and then thirdly is the public health aspect, namely how do you design cities and systems to encourage good behavior, to reduce infectious diseases, whatever. And we tend to focus only on the medical aspect and equivalent of cybersecurity, namely how do we add new by uh, whatever protocols or whatever, and tend to neglect somewhat uh, and, and have focused a lot on kind of the guilt part of telling people uh, you have to and don't click on bad links and, 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 and just upgrade your systems as consumers and all of that. And this has been, again, by a strained analogy, is what we've thought about obesity, namely, is the uh, 
model, namely, if you could only be a better and um, human being with more self-control, you wouldn't get fat. And so what you didn't do is people learned that it's much more complicated than that. There's biology, there's genes, there's uh, the availability of soft drinks, I mean, public health type of issues in there. And we need to get that same level of maturity in our research for cybersecurity to say, right. more than just, this is not about protocols or crypto or uh, even uh, necessarily operating software implementations, but how do we design all three aspects, same kind of a medical, uh, the individual behavior, at all levels and kind of public health aspects on that. Uh, I think this is starting to happen. You're starting to see people, for example, push back against the uh, cyber security education racket. Uh, basically, if we all could just train people to not do stupid things, then we wouldn't have all those problems. Uh, that, I think, is starting to happen a little bit, although it's not. I mean, if you're a public press, we're not there. So from a research perspective, what I do think is still too hard is scaling good design behavior uh, across uh, the, whole supply, the whole chain of development. So just to give you an example, I, right now, I don't really have, as a web developer, easy-to-use tools uh, that I just have part of my tool chain that will tell me that I have a potential SQL injection problem, cross-site scripting problem, uh, possibly leakage problem, whatever, any of the standard stuff. Secure you know. I'm sorry? Basically secure programming. Se secure programming, uh, like, uh, depending on what it is, I mean, all of these type of language or architecture-specific issues, which tools could do a lot better job of essentially preventing uh, or making me not make mistakes uh, in that. Because the number of people who are programming, we saw that in mean, the TAD hack type of model, there are lots more people who are doing API-based programming uh, that don't understand and shouldn't understand anything about cybersecurity. We don't support that well uh, in our tool. I think there's real opportunity for much better uh, for research that incorporates essential aspects of software engineering, namely how do real people develop software? Uh, what kind of mental models do they have of how the world works? What support do they need to make that mental model be reasonably aligned with reality? And how can they not have to do a lot of manual checking, which they A, don't understand because it's not their thing, uh, and B, that it is just, since you only need to make one mistake, uh, it's one of these you have to get it 100% right. Uh, that's not a good human trait for anybody, particularly given kind of the, the incent economic incentive for software development, the uh, distributed nature of design as in a single design system gets designed by hundreds of people over its lifetime uh, and so on. Uh, that, I think, is a real research opportunity. The other one is that when we saw that with TLS, this is closer to our area here, is that generally speaking, we've not done a good job on the even on a down protocol level, to make security easy to understand for people who use our protocols. Uh, this has been true for, I think, WebRTC. It's been true for email. Um, and you take every single one of those where just simply understanding how it works and building it is far more difficult than it really should be, which then, needless to say, leads to people not building it or doing it wrong because they think if they just call the right TLS library, uh, they have designed a secure system, not recognizing that there are all these subtleties about uh, certificate validation, for example, that may uh, or validating uh, in software updates or dealing with failure scenarios, all of these things. So, uh, there's an opportunity there to think more of a programmer as opposed to just what seems right cryptographically, where even at the lowest level we haven't done that. And that's, uh, I think, a fertile area for even revisiting some of the decisions 
with hindsight um, in what we've done. The final one is what you do far too little of, except in kind of keynote level talks, is that we don't really like to critique what we've done collectively in the past, you know, systematically, not just kind of over BOC. I mean, this was really stupid. I mean, how could we've ever done, uh, I mean, design Ike for IPsec in a way that you had to have a PhD in cryptography to understand it. Um, and that was not a smart idea, but more systematically looking at where did we go wrong and why don't things work the way, what assumptions turned out to be wrong, what, both in terms of users' assumptions as well as designers, and we're not doing a good job at that. Uh, I, just to add one more thing, and I want to hear the opinion of the industry. I mean, your list is exactly what I heard when I started working in Security at Verizon about 1998, which makes it just about 20 years ago. So nothing has happened. Nothing has changed. Things that, if anything, from your presentation earlier today, seems that they're going in the wrong direction. So uh, industry, would you, <laughs> would you care to add and then maybe even close? Talking about obesity and cyber terrorism, maybe Trump was on to something when he said a 400-pound <laughs> hacker. <laughs> <laughs> but he still doesn't know what cyber, cyber security is. <laughs> so he was ahead of us when he said 400 pound hacker doing something. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't think I can add anything more to what Henning, um, you know, explored uh, so nicely. I think a couple of things, um, you know, kind of, um, adjuncting to, to what he said was, I think security is tough. It's very hard to find programmers who know how to build scalable systems, who know how to build dependable systems, and who know how to build secure systems. Um, just you know, remember the whole kerfuffle that Apple went through um, with the Department of, uh, with the Justice Department when they were trying to get Apple to create a backdoor. There was people who said backdoors are good. It allows the good guys to keep track, you know, of what's going on. But by the very same backdoor, you'll have people misusing um, the backdoor and getting into the system. So I, you know, it, it's, it is a tough problem. I don't think there is a, a pithy answer that we can just give and, and, and go ahead. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is expectations. Now, not necessarily in regard to security, but as, as an industry, what do we teach consumers? And here's an example, a rather unfortunate example, but all of you remember Tesla and the self-driving cars, right? Remember in May there was an accident where this gentleman was apparently watching a movie on his iPad or iPod while in the Tesla car, and the Tesla car was in autopilot mode and he crashed into a truck. Now, it's very easy for us to say that he shouldn't be doing that, right? He should be paying attention to the road. But is that true? I mean, did we not, as an industry, tell people that this is technology that you can use right now? You could be reading, you know, oh, your... Yeah, you could be reading your book, you could be watching a movie, and the car will drive itself. Did we not say that? Right, so... You know, and I, I would love to see what was the bug that prevented this machine learning model from recognizing, you know, differentiating the white of the truck from the blue of the sky. But clearly, you know, any type of machine learning model is going to be probabilistic. So there's, therefore, there's going to be a probability of a false positive or a false well, negative. All right. If you have that probability of a false positive or a false negative, then we have to, you know, be a little bit more careful in how we position that technology. Um, recently, I heard that um, FCC, uh, not FCC, or um, not FCC, um, the Department of Transportation is asking Tesla not to call it an autopilot anymore, um, you know, because it has certain connotations. And then the last thing I just want to add is, I know we are driven by a media culture here. I always think it'll be great if 60 Minutes, instead of telling us who won this week's you know, NFL touchdown and everything, just said you know, on the journal Nature, these are a couple of interesting stories that you should look at. Maybe, maybe 60 Minutes can teach Trump <laughs> cybersecurity really is, along with 300 million Americans. Who are maybe you know, use the media to do some of that. <laughs> 
Okay, so would you like to finish? And give yeah, why not? A closing statement because I think we are. We are yeah, I, I think I can bring the educators' perspective to the table uh, since, and I think I can do this because I, I teach uh, a network security class at university. Uh, basically, uh, when I start my classes, one of the first introductory slides that I show is stolen to one of Enning's colleagues, Steve Bellowin, yeah. who is a great guru in security. I, I love his material and I think he has nice ideas, but one slide which is a fundamental one is the slide that says, look guys, human beings are the most unsecure devices over the internet. They need to be fed, they are expensive, they need to be maintained, and most importantly, they also pollute the environment. And he says, I, I still wonder why we, we keep on working with these devices. So the idea is that, obviously, the human factor is the most important one we have to take into account, and with this I share Henning's view that we need to work on education, uh, which means that not all of us have to become security engineers, but at least we should hope that all of us become uh, informed users of the Internet, which is a different task to achieve. Um, Again, related to education, if we teach security to students, I think that one of the most important messages that we need to pass to them, and I try to do this, uh, because you know I also do very practical stuff, so we do hacking, we, we do sniffing, we, do, we try exploits and so on and so forth, but I always try and pass the message that we want them to become security engineers, which means they have to be ethical hackers, so they have to know all the bad things in order to work on how to design uh, workarounds and how to protect us from bad things to happen, which is very, very important. And I think that uh, this is the, the future for uh, any uh, security engineer who wants to provide a real contribution. I also do believe that lately, at least lately, I hope that Henning and BJ agree with me, we have changed a bit our minds and, for example, all of the standardization bodies are now working on principles which are very basic ones and I would just mention the security by design approach. I mean, uh, Henning was mentioning WebRTC. I've been working with WebRTC since the beginning and believe me, security is a headache. It is a headache if you have to implement. It's a headache because it's complicated, because you need to understand a number of things. But it's something that needs to be there. And it needs to be there by design. So I was happy, for example, when we decided that within the WebRTC framework, we could not go for SDS, which is simpler when compared to other approaches. We went for the complicated path, but the most secure one. And now I'm happy of this because Again, you know, if you use these new protocols, they are more secure than the protocols that have been designed when we had in mind a different world, a different internet for everybody. On the other hand, just a, a, an alert, which came up to my mind today when I was listening to the presentation of the emergency services. Um, a, a very interesting panel was discussing security in emergency service architectures and the intrusion detection system concept came out, came to the floor. And there was, Bernarda Boba was uh, asking a, an interesting question. He was saying, look, you're talking about IDS, distributed intrusion detection within the network, but if you are monitoring, for example, WebRTC-based sessions, you get in trouble because everything is end-to-end -end encrypted. So if you have to work on sniffing packets, analyzing the data, and coming out with some, um, let's say, information about the potential presence of an attack pattern within those data, I think that BJ can explain better than me this. Uh, if you have encrypted data, this might become uh, much, much harder to achieve. So encryption is okay, end-to-end -end encryption is perfect, uh, but in some cases this uh, is not in favor of allowing for network-based approaches to security, which is something we need to, to think a, a bit about. So there are, uh, we, we have to properly strike a balance between 
uh, different uh, approaches when we want to have a holistic view of the security of a network. So there are, there are things that need to be well thought. Well, I think we have, uh, we have reached the end of the, of the uh, panel per se. So I think we should open the floor to some questions uh, for a few minutes. Uh, Jules, I mean, made a good point. Should stand because I have a mic. Uh, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, thank you. Uh, Simon, you make a good point, and all of you actually, Vijay Hennings, uh, Gaston, that security from design. Can you elaborate on that? Because it seems like we make protocols and then we are doing this roundabout, which is really complicated to talk about security. I personally feel cybersecurity is over talked about. And, and I'll take your class, Hennings, for sure. But uh, I just think that security from design is not given much attention at all in, uh, in network protocol design. And maybe it was because we didn't think that internet will ever be hacked. So can we elaborate more on that? Definitely security was an add-on from the very beginning, right? IP was designed for security. So that's like the mother of all sins. But no, I mean, I don't think it's... Most of the internet security problems are not because we didn't have encrypted protocols, for example. That's really not been a main issue. It's not, doesn't mean it's not a good idea to now what we know to, to make encryption essentially with default. But it's really more than it, the original, the problem of a security by design is really means at least two things. I mean, one is you have to have key pieces of infrastructure in place. My favorite kind of omission, so to say, is that we didn't have a good identifier proof of possession mechanism available. A lot of the problems that we have are really, this is in routing, this is in, um, in DDoS, address spoofing, this is in email, this is in uh, robocalls, you name it, uh, essentially identify our problems. Uh, namely, we have not had a DNS, I mean, you name it, we've had uh, every single identifier system didn't have, and still doesn't largely, have a convenient way of the good guys proving that they are who they claim to be and the bad guys not being able to do that. Uh, so there's key pieces of infrastructure that weren't designed from the beginning because we, and that's not as much, that's to some extent a protocol issue, but it's also setting up a machinery that actually allows that to happen because the most difficult part of TLS is not the protocol, as difficult as it is, the one that has caused the most trouble, trouble is the CA mechanism. Right. That's really been the operationally hard way. Yeah, no, not just architecture, but just the operational detail. Yeah. And the other one, security by design also means security by philosophy, if you like. Uh, I'm not an aerospace engineer, but from what you read and all that is that the ethos of at least vast majority of aerospace engineer, the culture of their field is you just don't do anything that puts for life or safety of a mission, depending on what part of aerospace you are, at risk. Mind. You will quit the company if necessary. You will, mind. there are mechanisms in place you, that you're usually presumably given the resources and tools. There is a, mind. the worst thing you can do is if, you, if it turns out what you did caused some accident. I mean, that will, if, that it's just not an acceptable, from a professional experience, an acceptable condition to be in. And we don't do that. And it's just to become kind of, yeah, everything is insecure. So if I'm cutting a corner at all levels, not just at the engineering level, but at management level, whatever, I mean, I'm just one part, I'm one small problem in a very big one. And that, unless we change that at and this is throughout management, not just, because right, it's management setting that example. It's uh, the, the safety, in other areas you call it the safety culture, and that matters because it filters all the way down to who you hire, how you reward people, how you train people, uh, what the collegial uh, interactions are, and until we get the incentive system right, it's going to be really difficult to make progress. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think the mindset has to move from you know security by design to design for security. Right. If you take a look at at various ways in which people manufacture, you see they have things like design for manufacturing, design for just in time inventory. So I think we ought to be thinking of designing for security so that as soon as we know we're going to create a protocol, the first thing that should come in our mind is that this protocol must be end-to-end -end encrypted. More than just right. So if I can add something to this just to, to conclude on security by design, if you push this to the extreme, this becomes paranoid design. And there are many people today who are paranoid about security. This might be okay or not, but paranoid design means that, for example, you take as references inside a single host papers like programming Satan's computer, which is a milestone for people who are afraid of anything that can happen in their own uh, PC. And then you assume that each and every packet that you deliver is delivered to the enemy. Each and every packet that you receive is received from the enemy, and this is paranoid. But the idea of having security by design, at least, for example, I take the standardization bodies as usual. If you were to write an internet draft some time ago, you just wrote your document, then in the end you had this security considerations section, and I think that both the guys who are here know this better than me. And so you, you just had to write something there because otherwise you could not reach the RFC state. This was the wrong approach. Nowadays, you need to write this security considerations section. As Vijay was saying, you need to write your document by having in mind security as a very first concern. And you need to interact with security-informed people before submitting your document. You can never arrive at a good standard today, I, I, I think I can say this, without interacting with the security guys. And this means also that you, have, you need more cross-fertilization. Because you cannot work, for example, in the applications and real-time area if you are not interacting with the security guys because they are really strictly interconnected. So you need to mix things up, you need to talk to people, you need to learn something which is not directly in your own research and application space, but you, you need to know at least basics of security and then you know who you have to contact in order to solve some issues. And then in the end, security by design means if you are working on networking protocols, you need to leave enough bits in your header because otherwise you're lost. Because if you did not think of those bits, then you need to provide for a new header, which is what happened, for example, with IP. I need to uh, interrupt a moment. I, I actually would like to say a few words about this. This is almost, this, to me, this was inspirational. We do have to quit. So I, I sort of want the last word. <laughs> and, and what I hear here and in many of the other, other uh, tracks is this understanding that somehow there's a, the, uh, the ethos, if you will, it is not exactly the ethos that we need. And that we're all sort of struggling without knowing how to start to change the ethos, and we're all getting pieces of that. And I think meetings like this one in particular, and meetings where researchers come together, are a place, and I will use a phrase from the 60s, where we're organizing from below. That is, you're not immediately going to try to... To, to change these structures in which we live, but you do them quietly from below. And meetings like this where we're talking are the way that starts. And you're saying, how do we, you know, how do we get on you know, the, the Twitter feeds or what have you. It actually starts quietly here. And even, I think, in uh, our discussions, I, I love the idea that you, you mentioned about why don't we build some tools. Now we have a community of developers who don't know our protocols, who don't know a lot of the background and where these came. Let's give them the tools. That would be a wonderful exercise for us you know, to, to do and it, when in fact provide a little discipline to the developer who right now does not have a structure. In the days of AT&T where you had almost a monolith that had rules and regulations and here's how you develop, okay, so, so, but today's developers don't have that. Even the kind of tools that you mentioned I think would be 
fabulous. It's not that people don't want to be building for a larger environment in which our stuff all fits together, but they don't have a structure for it, and that begins to provide it. I thought that was a great idea. And the, the uh, Jatak was, <laughs> was another. I mean, give me more tools. Give me tools. And that will be the beginning of this, this, this other culture. People are begging for that, and they don't right now have those, those tools. They don't want to be isolated, but they have nothing that's bringing them together. So I find this inspirational, and I hope people will <laughs> draw that inspiration. Now, now that I've had my piece... <laughs> We have 20 minutes to eat and get back to hear Admiral Simpson, who is going to be uh, talking in the, uh, the, the afternoon. I forget what we call them now. Uh, <laughs> he'll be in the West Ballroom. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.